Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In this video, we're going to continue our survey of different optimization methods and we're going to briefly look at penalty methods and linear programming. Another computational strategy for constrained optimization is to employ penalty methods. And this converts a constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained one. And the key idea is to introduce a new objective function that's a weighted sum of our original objective function plus our constraint. So suppose we look at the minimization problem where we want to minimize f of x subject to g of x is equal to zero. And here, following our usual conventions, f will be a function from rn to r and g will be a function from rn to rm. So we could consider the related unconstrained problem where we want to minimize phi rho of x, which is equal to f of x plus a half rho times g transpose of x times g of x. And let x star be the solution to our constrained problem and x star rho be the solution to our unconstrained problem with parameter rho. Then, under appropriate conditions, it can be shown that the limit as rho tends to infinity of x star rho will be equal to x star. So, in practice, we can solve the unconstrained problem for a large value of rho to get a good approximation of x star. Another strategy is to solve for a sequence of penalty parameters, rho k, where x star rho k is used as a starting guess to solve for x star rho k plus 1. However, a major drawback of penalty methods is that a large factor of rho will increase the condition number of the Hessian of phi rho and will make the unconstrained problem increasingly more difficult to solve. However, penalty methods can be convenient, particularly because they are simple to implement. So let's now take a look at a Python example that demonstrates some of these ideas. We'll now look at demonstrating the penalty method for solving constrained optimization problems. And we'll make use of an example that we first introduced in the Lagrange multiplier section. We'll aim to minimize the function f of x and y is equal to x plus y, subject to the constraint that g of x and y, which is equal to 2x squared plus y squared minus 5, is equal to 0. And on the plot on the right, the blue lines correspond to the contours of the function f, and the dotted yellow ellipse corresponds to the feasible set s, where g is equal to 0. And using Lagrange multipliers, we can verify that our function f has a local minimum on s at minus the square root of 5 6 and minus the square root of 10 thirds. And that local minimum is shown by the small yellow dot in the plot. We're going to look at using the penalty method and we'll therefore consider finding the local minima of the function phi rho which is equal to f plus rho g squared divided by 2, where rho is a constant. So the plot shows contours of phi rho, and to begin with, we're going to look at where rho is equal to 0, and therefore phi rho is just equal to f. And we'll make use of a nonlinear spacing of the contours. So we're looking at values where phi rho is equal to z plus z cubed divided by 100, where z is an integer. And this nonlinear spacing just deals with the fact that the values of g grow rapidly when we move away from the feasible set, and therefore this nonlinear spacing prevents the contours from becoming too close. As mentioned in the plot, the dotted yellow line shows us the feasible set s, where g is equal to 0. The small yellow circle shows us the minimum of f on the feasible set, and we'll also plot a large sign circle to show us the minimum of phi rho. And to begin with, when rho is equal to zero, phi rho does not have a minimum. But I'm now going to look at increasing rho, 
and we'll see that the minimum of phi rho enters in from the bottom left corner. And as rho increases, we see that the sine circle becomes closer and closer to the yellow circle, and therefore the penalty method gives us a better and better approximation to the solution to the constrained problem. If we look at the contours of our function phi rho, then we see that it has an elliptical valley that follows our feasible set. And if we move away from our feasible set, then phi rho grows rapidly. And this heavily penalizes the possibility for our local minimum of phi rho to lie away from the feasible set. As rho increases, our local minimum must lie closer and closer to the feasible set. We'll now take a look at a Python program that can find this minimum of phi rho as rho increases. The program penalty.py demonstrates solving our example penalty method optimization problem, and to perform the optimization steps, we're going to make use of the Newton method. And to begin with in this program, we're first going to define our objective function f, its gradient and its hessian, and we'll also define our constraint function g, and its gradient and its hessian. And for this example, the gradients and hessians work out as simple calculations. In particular, we can see that the hessian of f is just equal to the zero matrix. We then define our function phi rho via calls to f and g, and we also define the gradient and hessian of phi rho. We then define a function solve that can find a stationary point of our phi function. And solve takes in two arguments, a two component vector z that gives the initial guess for our Newton method and the current value of our parameter rho. Within this function, we'll perform Newton steps until the step size falls below a tolerance of 10 to the minus 14. And within this loop, we first calculate the Hessian of our function phi, and we keep track of the sum of the condition numbers of the Hessians, and we also keep track of the number of Newton steps that have been performed. We then perform the Newton step by solving a linear system involving the Hessian. At the end, we return three values. We return the two component solution in z. We return the average Hessian condition number, and we also return the number of Newton steps that have been performed. We'll then loop over a range of values of rho, uh, starting with rho equal 1, and we'll use an initial guess of minus 1 comma minus 1. And we'll then call our solve function, and we'll print out the value of rho, the components of our solution, the average Hessian condition number, and the number of Newton steps that have been performed. We'll multiply rho by 10 and loop again until rho reaches 10 to the 13. And in each time through this loop, we'll use the previous solution as the initial guess for our next call to the solve function. So let me now go ahead and run this program. And we see that there are five columns of output. The first column shows us our values of rho, and the next two columns show us the components of our solution. And we can see that there is convergence to a solution, and we can verify that we're indeed converging to the local minimum of the exact constrained problem. The fourth column shows us the average condition numbers of the Hessian, and we can see that these grow to be rather large. And in particular, these are growing so large that we're approaching the level where machine precision may become important in solving the linear systems. The final 
column shows us the number of calls we made to the Newton step. And on the first time we call solve, 10 Newton steps were required. And this is because our initial guess of minus 1, comma minus 1 wasn't very accurate. However, on subsequent calls, the previous solution uh, for the previous value of rho was a better initial guess, and therefore we see that the number of Newton steps starts to drop. So let's now take a look at plotting some of these results, and to do so, we'll run the program again and save the results to a temporary file called out. We'll now look at plotting these results in GNU plot. And to begin with, I'm going to plot the average Hessian condition number as a function of rho. And we can see that as rho increases, the average Hessian condition number grows, and we have a straight line in the log log plot, and therefore we see that there is a power law relationship. In particular, if we also plot the line x, then we see that the slope matches, and therefore the Hessian condition number scales linearly with rho. Let's now look at the convergence of our penalty method solution to the true solution of the exact constrained problem. And so here we see again a straight line behavior. And if we overlay on this plot one divided by x, then we see that the slopes agree. And therefore we see the accuracy of our penalty method solution to the exact solution to our constraint problem is inversely proportional to rho. Let's now briefly look at linear programming. And in the introduction to this unit, we discuss that this is an important subfield of optimization. And suppose that we look at the optimization problem where we want to minimize f of x subject to g of x is equal to zero and h of x is less than or equal to zero. And here, f, g, and h are all affine, meaning that they are linear plus a constant. And in this case, we would refer to this optimization problem as a linear program. And because of this special affine structure, there are many important simplifications that can occur for this optimization problem. And firstly, the feasible region of this problem will be a convex polyhedron. In addition, since the objective function maps our hyperplane, it can have no isolated local minima, and therefore its global minimum must occur at a vertex of the feasible region. Let's now take a look at an example in R squared. And here we have five inequality constraints. We require that x1 is greater than zero, x2 is greater than zero, and then we have three additional inequality constraints that require that our solution is on one side of the three lines shown in yellow green and red. And taken together, these five inequality constraints define a feasible region that is a convex polygon shown in dark blue here. So the standard approach for solving linear programs is conceptually simple. We want to examine a sequence of vertices to find the minimum, and this is called the simplex method. But despite its conceptual simplicity, it's actually non-trivial to develop an efficient implementation of this method, and we're not going to look at this in detail here. In the worst case, the computational work required for the simplex method grows exponentially with the size of the problem. But this worst case behavior is extremely rare, and in practice, the simplex method is very efficient, and the computational work typically grows linearly. 
There are newer methods, such as interior point methods, that have been developed that are polynomial in the worst case, but nevertheless, the simplex method is the standard approach since it is more efficient than the interior point method for most cases. So we're now going to look at a Python example of solving a linear program, and we're going to look at minimizing f of x that is equal to minus 5x1 minus 4x2 minus 6x3, and we see here that this f is indeed affine in form. And we're going to apply six inequality constraints. We're going to require that x1 minus x2 plus x3 is less than or equal to 20, 3x1 plus 2x2 plus 4x3 is less than or equal to 42, and 3x1 plus 2x2 is less than or equal to 30. And then in addition, we require that x1, x2, and x3 are all positive. And as we'll see in the example, linear program solvers are efficient and convenient. And often the main challenge is to formulate our problem as a linear program in the first place. And there are actually some surprising examples where problems that appear to have a very different structure can actually be recast as linear programs and can then be solved by techniques such as the simplex method or interior point method. Let's now look at the program linprog.py that demonstrates solving a linear program using the cvxopt library. And we're going to look at the example linear program given in the slides where we're trying to minimize a linear function f of a three component vector x subject to six inequality constraints. And on the left here, I'm showing a visualization of the feasible set given by the six constraints. And we see that this forms a convex polyhedron. We can see that there are five sides to this polyhedron. And we can show that the first inequality constraint is actually dominated by all of the others and therefore doesn't contribute a face to this polyhedron. This is a common feature of linear programs that certain constraints may be dominated by others. If we look at the program, then we first define the constraints in our problem. We define a three by six matrix A and the first row of this matrix gives us the coefficients of x1 in our constraints. The second row gives us the coefficients of x2 and the third row gives us the coefficients of x3. And we use the convention that x1, x2, x3 are on the less than or equal side of our inequality constraints. And we would therefore have to shift these x1, x2, x3 terms over to the other side in order to get them into this form. And that would introduce a minus sign that corresponds to the three minus signs that we see here. The matrix B gives us the right-hand sides of our six inequality constraints. We then define a matrix C that gives us the coefficients in front of x1, x2, x3 in our objective function. And using A, B, and C, we then call our linear program a solver. We'll also look at an alternative formulation using the scipy.optimize library in linprog underscore alt dot pi. And this solves the same linear program and uses many of the same data structures. The only difference is that the scipy.optimize routine requires the transpose form of our matrix A. So now A is a six by three matrix. And if we look at the first row of this matrix, then that gives us the coefficients of x1, x2, x3 in our first constraint. And in both programs, we will solve the linear program and output the result. So let's now go ahead and run these two programs.
So when we, when we run linprog.py, then we find that it outputs an optimal solution. And the x1 value is essentially equal to zero to the accuracy of our solver. And then x2 is equal to 15 and x3 is equal to 3. Let's now run the second version. And again, we find the same solution. We have 0, 15, and 3 within the accuracy of our method. So let's now plot our solution onto this graph on the left. And our solution is shown by this magenta circle. And as expected for a linear program, the solution is located at a vertex of our feasible set.